was built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I cannot trust the sweetest pain, but holy... My cousin has one boy who just graduated from college and a daughter who's about to graduate. I have a nephew who is a new dad. Happy Father's Day, Dylan. And he is about halfway through his period of enlistment with the Marine Corps. They're the age when one's expected to be figuring out what one is going to do with the rest of their lives. In contrast to them, I think of Abraham. Poor old Abraham didn't know God's plan for his life until he was 75 years old when God promised to make him the father of a nation through which all nations would be blessed. Things look like they're pretty well sorted out as he goes to the promised land and God shows him the future of himself and his progeny. But that's when everything stalled. When the promise wasn't fulfilled in what Abraham thought was a timely manner, he started to take things into his own hands and his life became both scary and messy. Nearly a quarter of a century passes. At 99 years old, God appears to him again and says that God has not chosen to do things the way Abraham tried to do them. But it would be through Abraham's wife. Abraham's wife would be the mother of nations. And the Bible tells us that when Abraham heard this, he laughed. No more than a few months later, God appears to Abraham again and tells him that Sarah will give birth within the year. Sarah, listening from the tent, overhears this and she laughs. But finally, when Abraham is 100 years old and Sarah is 90, she does give birth. And what do they name their son? They name him He Laughs, or Isaac in Hebrew. And thus, with hearty laughter, began the nation of Israel. Before we consider what the point of Abraham's story might be, I want to ask you a question. There's quite a difference between what is normal and what is good, isn't there? Normal is what we usually expect to exist or happen. Sometimes we describe normal as typical. When we come to a place where we can pass a slower car, and as we pull out to go around them, they speed up. We turn, turn to our spouse and say, that's typical. There are things in this world that are normal, but they aren't good. If we're honest, there is a lot of bad that is also normal. The poor we have with us always. There have always been both oppressors and the oppressed, exploiters and the exploited. There has always been unequal justice and government favoritism toward one group or another. Normally, there is more than one war at a time going on in the world. Some degree or another of crime in our communities is normal. It is also normal that some people become sick, some are maimed, and all of us die. Normal does not equal good. One of the normal things in life that isn't good is that none of us are perfect. Carry on. The worst part about yeah, that is that our normal state of imperfection causes a disconnect with God who is perfect and good. Now, some folks will immediately jump on the old saw. If God is all powerful, then he is not good. If God is good, then he is not all powerful, blah, 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 blah. Their assumption being that God would force his standard of good on everyone and everything if only he had the power. Into this dichotomy between our broken world and a perfect God comes the message of this week's epistle reading, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. How does what is broken get repaired? We are justified through faith. What does it mean to be justified? It means my relationship with God becomes just as if I'd never sinned. What is faith? Faith is a receptiveness to what God has to offer, rooted in a trust of God. We have peace with God through Jesus. The root in the Bible's word for peace means to join. 
through Jesus, we become connected with the Creator God and with the faith community. That's not normal, but it is good. We have grace through Jesus. What is grace? God's riches at Christ's expense, God's unmerited favor. In other words, grace is receiving blessings we haven't earned, but which God has bestowed upon us anyway. Then in verses 6 through 8, Paul uh, ties in with this concept of receiving justification, peace, and grace without our having done anything to merit these blessings. Tom Bennett was a boy in the neighborhood I played basketball with once. He was a couple of years older, but instead of lording his greater skills over me, he gently coached me on how to improve my game. Despite being a pacifist because of his Christian faith, he joined the army and became a medic during the Vietnam War. A grenade was thrown into a trench where he was treating the wounded. Tom jumped on that grenade and gave his life to save the lives of those to whom he had already been ministering. Maybe someday we'll dive deeper into how it all works, but the Bible says in this passage that in order for us to live, to have justification, peace, and lives of grace, in order for us to live, Jesus had to die. Now, you might die for your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, but would you die for someone who had been living in opposition to your purposes? Look at who Jesus died for. Christ died for the, quote, the powerless, the ungodly, and the sinners. There are a few takeaways here. First, if everything in your life isn't the way you think it should be, that's normal. But that doesn't mean it's good, or that normal is even the only option. Secondly, if we keep doing things the normal way, we can expect normal results. Third, Jesus can help. Through him we can receive, by faith, justification, that is, just as if I'd never sinned, peace, that is, connection with God and others, and God's rich blessings, which is grace. But once we finish doing our happy dance, <laughs> we need to read verses three through five. Uh, just as there was a messy period in Abraham's life before Isaac was finally born, as we begin to receive these good gifts from God, we also become abnormal, not typical. The world does not respond well to different. Anything abnormal is treated like it's the problem. The closer we move to justice, to loving acts of mercy, to walking humbly with God, the more the evil in the world around us focuses on us like antibodies focus on a virus. Paul delivers the bad news that the earthly life of the Christian will be accompanied by suffering, some of which is a result of being different. But that suffering will build perseverance, which will build character, and that character will build hope. Yes, we have the hope of the glory of God, but even during our time of suffering mixed with our blessings, we experience that God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. All of this, Paul writes, is a demonstration of what is the, at the root of everything, God's love for us. God loves us enough that he sent his son to die for us and his Holy Spirit to live in us until that glorious day when we see God face to face and like God become perfect and whole. We don't know God's timing. His plan for our lives is revealed and unfolded on his schedule, certainly not ours. But we have this promise, he loved us first. So he sent his son to die for us. His love is in us through the Holy Spirit as we swim against the world's normal current. One day, we will join God in God's glory. When we do, the laughter of our doubts will be replaced by the laughter of our rejoicing 
as we gather for a party at the table of the one who loved us first, the one who loves us most. For God is love. On Christ the solid rock I stand.